So hello and welcome to another episode of Biographics. I'm your interim host, Carl Smold, and today we're talking about Robin Hood, the most celebrated outlaw of all time. Original article by Radu Alexander. We find ourselves in England during the late 12th century. The country is in disarray as King Richard the Lionheart is off fighting in the Crusades, leaving his throne exposed to the devious machinations of Prince John. The younger sibling covets his brother's power and plans to steal the English crown for himself. He is aided by the dastardly Sheriff of Nottingham, who uses unaffordable taxes in order to oppress the peasantry and fill his master's coffers. Is there nobody who will stand up to such tyrants? Nobody who will pick up the bow and the sword to fight for the innocent people of England? Well, in fact, there is one such man, a brave outlaw who will lead a gang of rogues and outcasts against the reign of terror, a charitable bandit who will steal from the rich and give to the poor, a man known as Robin Hood. As is often the case with historical figures from that era, the early years of Robin Hood, sometimes also spelled as Robin Hood, R-O-B-Y-N-H-O-D-E, or Rob Hood, R-O-B-B-E-H-O-D is one big mystery. Back then, people only bothered to record details about your life if you were royalty. Everyone else was taught that they did not matter from a very early age. As is the way for the British peasantry. Therefore, we can only make a few informed guesses regarding Robin's birth. We know that he was of fighting age when he joined King Richard I in the Third Crusade, which happened during the early 1190s. So this will suggest that Robin Hood was born somewhere between 1160 and 1170. His place of birth is equally confusing, mainly because several places have tried to claim Robin Hood as one of their own. Given that his arch enemy was the Sheriff of Nottingham, that that's where he was born. However, the County of Yorkshire begs to disagree, arguing that the heroic outlaw was born in their neck of the woods. If we're going strictly by the most popular option, then the village of Loxley, which is near Sheffield, yeah, Sheffield, in South Yorkshire would be our best bet. This claim is bolstered by the fact that Robin's earliest known adventures as an outlaw do not take place in the famous Sherwood Forest, but Barnsdale Forest, again in Yorkshire. These signs point to the fact that Robin Hood was born a Yorkshireman. Yes! So I, I, I'm, I, I, that's, I'm a Yorkshireman. I, yeah. So these signs point to the fact that Robin Hood was born a Yorkshireman and cut his teeth in familiar surroundings while moving to Nottingham and encountering the vile sheriff who preyed on the innocent locals. But before this, Robin travelled to Jerusalem to fight in the Crusades and retake the Holy Land from the Ayyubid dynasty, led by the mighty Salahuddin. As we mentioned, this was the Third Crusade, which may have been the most ambitious one of all. The King of England, Richard the Lionheart, loved a good fight a lot more than he did reigning peacefully and quietly at home. Therefore, as soon as he succeeded to the throne after his father, Henry II, he began making preparations for war, hoping to erase from history the failure of the Second Crusade. The fact it's known as the Third Crusade would indicate he didn't exactly succeed. He was joined in his endeavour by France, led by Philip II, and the Holy Roman Empire, led by Frederick Barbarossa, as well as a few minor powers. But this is Robin Hood's story, so if you want to learn how the crusade turned out, you can check out the bios already done on both Richard the Lionheart and Salah Hadin. As far as Robin is concerned, we have no details regarding his service to the Crusade, so we are going to fast forward to the moment when he returned to England. As he was making his way to his home in Nottingham, he was expecting a hero's welcome, but that is not what greeted him. Instead, he was shocked to discover that the evil sheriff, under instructions from Prince John, had enacted draconian taxes, and all those who did not pay had their lands and their property confiscated. And that was how Robin Hood found out that his family home had fallen prey to the sheriff's greed and was now owned by the Crown. Right then and there, Robin vowed that he would not take this lying down. He would get revenge on the Sheriff of Nottingham for this injustice, with fire and with steel. And that is how Robin Hood became an outlaw, but fortunately for him, he did not have to do it alone. He was hardly the only person who had been wronged by the Sheriff, and there were others who were willing to fight. So Robin Hood began forming his own company of soldiers, his band of merry men. This is so quintessentially British, just a guy in a hood with some merry men. Anyone who's ever heard the tale of Robin Hood already knows that he was not the lone wolf type, and that he preferred to take on Prince John and his minions, assisted by a group of like-minded outlaws dubbed the Merry Men. We start, of course, with none other than Robin's trusty second-in-command, Little John. Whenever there was a fight to be had, John was right there by Robin's side, swinging his quarterstaff. Over seven feet tall, with a great big bushy beard, and dressed in animal skins, he was the kind of hard to miss. In this case, his nickname Little was intended ironically and used mainly because his real name might have been John Little. I was British. So, so um, creative when it comes to our nicknames. But Little John was not only feared for his size, but his skill. 
which may have even outmatched that of Robin Hood himself. Nowhere is this more evident than the story of how the two first met. One day, they ran into each other while crossing a narrow bridge at the same time. They started from opposite ends and met in the middle, and neither one wanted to back down and let the other go first. So they started fighting using wooden quarter staffs. A bad idea given that was like, you know, that was Little John's weapon of choice. Little John won that encounter and knocked Robin Hood down. At that point, some of Robin's other cohorts arrived, but Mr. Hood had no interest in more conflict. He recognised talent when he saw it, so he offered Little John a spot in his band of outlaws, and the two soon became inseparable. Just behind Robin Hood and Little John, you'd usually find a younger man, dressed to the nines in fine clothes and silks, just as sharp his wit as he was with his blade. Sort of like a medieval Deadpool. He was Will Scarlet, sometimes also spelled Scathelock, S-C-A-T-H-E-L-O-K-E, -E, or Scarlock, S-C-A-R-L-O-C-K. And do not let his youth and appearance deceive you. Will Scarlet might have been the most dangerous member of the Merry Men due to his temptuousness and skill with the sword. If you angered him, there was a decent chance you might not be making out of the fight alive. So it makes sense that in like you know, the Star Trek episode, that's what that's Worf becomes Will Scarlet. It's, I like, you can judge my I, I like Star Trek. In contrast to Will Scarlet, we had Friar Tuck, the clergyman of the group. He fulfilled the stereotypical role of the big guy who was fun and jolly as long as there's food and ale available. Tuck was a happy man, but again, looks can be deceiving. After all, Robin did not recruit Tuck to be his drinking buddy when push came to shove that Friar was more than capable of handling himself. And he too claimed victory over Robin Hood during a fight once. So he basically had like his Final Fantasy one party. Like Robin Hood the Archer, like Little John, was like, you know, the, the warrior. You had Will Scarlet, like the red mage, like oh, red. And then you had like Friar Tuck the monk. Let's go. Lastly, while not considered an official member of the Merry Men, we have to mention Maid Marian, Robin Hood's true love. A noble by birth, she started off as a damsel in distress, trapped in the clutches of the Sheriff of Nottingham who wanted to force it into marriage. But then she began working for, as a spy for Robin Hood, gathering and supplying information about the Sheriff's plans and conspiracies. Once she was freed from the castle, Robin Hood started training Marion to use the sword and the bow, and she sometimes even disguised herself as a man and took part in some of the adventures alongside the Merry Men. Together with his band of merry men, Robin Hood sought to right some of the wrongs committed by the Sheriff of Nottingham and his henchmen. Although, truth be told, he did not start off as a benevolent do-gooder that is remembered by history. At first, Robin Hood was mainly concerned with his own well-being, and the well-being of his gang of rogues. Their chief crime was hunting deer illegally in the King's Woods, at a time when meat was an exceedingly rare treat for the lower classes. All that venison just casually strolling around through the forest was a great temptation, but your average Englishman was forbidden from hunting them, and the punishments were exceedingly harsh, often involving losing a limb or even your life. That is why the fights between the outlaws and the foresters were often so violent, even deadly. And perhaps the greatest myth that surrounds the sanitised image of Robin Hood that survives to this day is that he was a gentle and merciful man, and only fought in self-defence. Not so. Robin Hood was a killer, plain and simple, and many men perished thanks to the flight of his arrow or the swing of his sword. We saw Robin Hood at his most bloodthirsty when he went up against one of his most notorious foes, Guy of Gisborne. Gisborne was a mercenary who had been hired to track down and kill Robin Hood, but his interrogation skills could have used a little more polish. One day, while strolling through the forest, Guy of Gisborne stumbled upon a stranger and asked him if he knew where to find Robin Hood, because he was there to kill him. That stranger, of course, was none other than Robin Hood himself, who chose not to disclose his identity, but instead to challenge Gisborne to an archery contest and gauge his skills. Once Robin Hood won the contest, he revealed himself and the two engaged in a sword fight. Although injured, the outlaw managed to slay the hired killer, but then he went full Jason Voorhees on him and cut off Gisborne's head, stuck on top of his bow, and slashed his face to bits with a knife. His goal here was to make the head unrecognisable. He could then don Gisborne's clothes and enter the camp of the sheriff who had hired the mercenary in the first place. And that incident is not even Robin's only beheading, but it's a good example that illustrates that under the right circumstances, Robin Hood could be as vicious and violent as any other outlaw who prowled the forests of England. Then there's that whole stealing from the rich and giving to the poor business. But does it have any actual merits? Well, sort of, but definitely not at the beginning of Robin Hood's criminal career. Back then, uh, the most he would do for the peasantry was simply to leave them alone, but only if they were honest with him. It was said that any time Robin Hood and his men would encounter a stranger in whatever forest they were hiding in, they would invite them to sit down and partake until they all got on venison. Once they were done eating, Robin would ask them how much money they had on them. If they were truthful, then they got to keep their money, regardless if they were a peasant, a knight, a monk, or a bishop. If they were in dire straits, Robin might even lend them a few books to tide them over. But if they were caught lying, regardless of their social status, they would be stripped of not only their cash, but their clothes and sent into the forest, tied to their horse, riding buck naked 
and backwards. It does seem though, as the years went by, Robin Hood became more charitable with all the funds he was stealing. Even so, he never rode into a village with a giant bag with a dollar sign on it and began tossing out the coins to grateful peasants, like Ezio in an Assassin's Creed game. Instead, he preferred to use that money to build houses and repair churches. Another misconception was that Robin Hood was an enemy of the land-owning upper classes, that he was some kind of Che Guevara-style revolutionary who wanted to overturn the social systems of England. That's not the case. If anything, Robin Hood rallied against corruption regardless of where it originated. Monks, abbots and bishops were some of his most frequent targets, because Robin Hood was also a devout Catholic and showed particular disdain for those who pervert his beliefs in order to enrich themselves. All these enemies were of course mere appetizers, and we all know that the main event was Robin Hood versus the wicked and powerful man known only as the Sheriff of Nottingham. To give him his full title though, he was the High Sheriff of Nottinghamshire, Derbyshire and the Royal Forest, and his duty was to oversee that everyone obeyed the King's law. In reality though, the Sheriff of Nottingham was a corrupt official who made himself and Prince John rich by enforcing exorbitant taxes and confiscating the property of anyone who looked at him funny. I'd have been screwed. I'm always looking at people funny. Robin Hood first appeared on the Sheriff's radar when the latter heard of the former leading a band of outlaws that hunted deer in Sherwood Forest. At this point, the Sheriff of Nottingham saw Robin Hood and his merry men as just another gang of outlaws, simply some flies he could swat away with a wave of his hand. But as they kept surviving every encounter with the guards and foresters he sent to deal with them, the Sheriff realised that they were not mere trifle. For his part, Robin Hood never backed away from an opportunity to antagonise the Sheriff, and the two soon became arch nemesises. Nemesises? Nemeses? Nemeses. Despite the extreme animus that ultimately developed between the two of them, it seemed at first that Robin Hood was content with simply humiliating and robbing the sheriff instead of anything more violent. He particularly enjoyed using tricks or disguises to get the sheriff to enter Sherwood Forest, which Robin Hood considered to be his home turf. The sheriff often left the woods sans money, and sometimes even clothes, but the point is that he did leave in one piece. Why exactly Robin Hood showed such clemency towards the sheriff isn't really clear, especially since he was far more merciful than he was with lesser enemies. Some have speculated that Robin Hood acted this way at the behest of the sheriff's wife, whom the outlaw considered a good woman and held in high regard. Or perhaps, you know, I, I can't do the wink wink nudge nudge, but you know, wink wink nudge nudge. But still had his limits, and it was inevitable that the rival between Robin Hood and the sheriff of Nottingham would finally end with one of them dead. There are several versions of how the evil sheriff bit the dust, but the most common one involves an archery contest, which he organised a trap to lure in the great Robin Hood. The he knew that the outlaw would not be able to resist a chance to show that he was the greatest marksman in all the land. The sheriff was right and Robin did appear, but he overestimated the prowess of his soldiers, who proved to be no match for the merry men. The fun and games were over though, and this time Robin Hood did not forgive the sheriff for his treachery. Instead, he loosed a single arrow which pierced through the sheriff of Nottingham's black heart, and then, for bonus points, he also decapitated his former arch enemy. Old habits die hard. This happened sometime around 1194. That was the year that King Richard made it back to England, undoing all of the schemes of his younger brother to usurp the throne. Prince John fled the country, and most of his supporters either joined him or surrendered to Richard the Lionheart. The king then proceeded to pardon Robin Hood for all of his crimes. The outlaw was free to marry Maid Marian at St. Mary's Church in Edwinstow, and even today he's remembered as the village of Robin Hood. Alas, though modern retellings of Robin Hood's adventures prefer to give him a happy ending, where he lives happily ever after alongside Maid Marian, the real Robin Hood did not benefit from such a cushy retirement, and he met his end courtesy of treachery from one he trusted. As the years went on and Robin Hood got older and sicker, the shot of his arrow was getting a little wider off the mark and the swing of his sword getting a little weaker. Half a lifetime spent living in the woods couldn't have been good for him, and medieval medicine wasn't exactly known for being potent or painless. One day Robin Hood travelled to the Kirkless Priory in Yorkshire to get himself bled. This was a common medical practice at the time. Basically their version of aspirin. If you weren't feeling well, just get some of that sickly blood out of your system and wait for it to be replaced with new, fresh, healthy blood. Robin Hood knew that this would leave him in a weakened and thus vulnerable state, yet he resisted persuasion attempts to take a bodyguard with him, instead of being joined only by his trusty companions. Little John, who was also getting on in years. After all, the bloodletting procedure was even being done by his cousin, who was the prioress at Kirklees. But little did Robin Hood know that his cousin had cruel intentions in mind, because he had been corrupted by one of the outlaw's many enemies, Sir Roger of Doncaster, who seduced her and then convinced her to slay Robin by simply draining too much blood. Eventually, Robin realised the treachery that had been done to him, but it was too little, too late. He sounded his horn and little John came bursting into the room, but he had lost too much blood to be saved. John immediately understood what had happened, and unsurprisingly, his first reaction was to strike down his friend's killer. He was stopped, however, by Robin Hood, who had never harmed a woman and was not about to start now. They say that in his final moments, Robin Hood asked his faithful companion to bring him to the window and fetch him his bow. 
Then, with a final rush of strength, he shot one last arrow and asked to be buried where it landed. Kirkley's Priory lies in ruins nowadays, but there are a few structures still left standing, including the grave purported to belong to Robin Hood. So could this actually be his? Let's say that it's not impossible, but we will call it highly unlikely, mainly because Robin Hood did not actually exist. That's right, Robin Hood is not real, and this was our little April Fool's joke. If you spent the last 20 minutes thinking otherwise, then you could take solace in knowing they were definitely not the only one. I, I was like, I always knew it was like a myth. You got, that's when they got me. Because I read it, I, I, you know, the article was written by our, uh, our author, Radu Alexander. And I, I knew it was like a Brit, like, okay, is Robin Hood a real dude? Is he not? Was he a myth? Is it like, you know, a conflation of historical events? Is it a couple of people put into one person? Okay, you got me. You got me. <laughs> I was getting really drawn into that then. I was like, okay. Because I generally think, oh yeah, they do some good research work at biographics. Like, they must have, maybe there's something I didn't know. <sighs> so if, like me, you spent the last 20 minutes thinking that Robin Hood might have been real, um, you're definitely not the only one. Ever since the first ballads about the outlaw appeared around five to 600 years ago, many, many people have questioned and debated the historicity of Robin Hood. There's a popular fun fact regarding Robin Hood that he's the only mythical figure included in Oxford Dictionary's National Biography. This isn't strictly true, there are 10 others, but the existence of the rest is somewhat more open to interpretation, while evidence for the existence of Robin Hood has been described as, and I paraphrase here, although very large in volume, will not bear scholarly examination. While the chances of a genuine Robin Hood, an outlaw who robbed from the rich and gave to the poor, are slim to none, historians and folklorists have posited the possibility of Robin Hood being at the very least inspired by a real life figure. They know of a fugitive named Robert Hodd. There was also a real Robin of Loxley, but these are simply names on pieces of paper. There is nothing to suggest that either of them did anything resembling the actions of their legendary namesake. And if you've been sitting here thinking that our story of Robin Hood is not the same one you've heard, there is a simple reason for that. The legend of Robin Hood has changed a lot over the centuries, with new writers modifying the canon to better please their audiences. Initially a lowly yeoman in the service of a king named Edward and Maid Marion and the Sheriff of Nottingham were nowhere to be seen. He was a lot more vicious and violent, but hundreds of years later he's morphed into the more benevolent aristocrat turned rogue with a heart of gold that we know and still love today. That was a fun one. So thank you for joining me on this episode of Biographics. I'm recording this in August of 2022. So if this actually does go out on April Fools and I'm still hosting for uh, Biographics, uh, just leave a congratulations to me in the comments because that means I, I did a good job. I'm trying my best. Well, presumably my, if I'm still doing it, my setup would either be very different or exactly the same. So the only two options available to me. I, I, I rarely change much, but yeah, this is, I've been your host, Cal Smallwood, the, the article written by Rado Alexander, links to which you can find below. And as always, um, like, comment, subscribe, and have the day you deserve.